and welcome to our panel discussion on the third and final day of the Sparks 2014 International Conference. Um, we might just quickly begin by going through everybody's names just in case people have just woken up and are tuning in for the first time today. So we can start with you, Prescott. Prescott Breeden. Monique Udell. Catherine Lord. I have no idea what my name is. <laughs> <laughs> Last time I checked, it was Patricia McConnell. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, that'll work. Um, I'm Mia Cobb. I'm Julie Hecht. I'm Clive Wynn. Simon Gadois. I'm uh, James Serple. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that makes me Ray Coppinger. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we've had an amazing third day today with our theme of science in training. And we have had some really big, broad topics coming through, both from the live audience here in Rhode Island and also online through our Twitter participants. Um, we're going to really just dive in at the deep end, okay? And hopefully it doesn't get too ugly. But I guess one of the initial comments came in saying, scientists can respectfully disagree, as can dog trainers, but we feel that do no harm should frame our strategies. We've also had other comments that have drawn in on the interplay of dog personality, handler education, training methodology, and the environment on dog behaviour and the consequences for the welfare of dogs. And now this is a topic that reaches into philosophy and ethics as well as biology and psychology and anthrozoology. So I pretty much want to just open up the floor and, and ask you to comment and we'll, we'll see where the conversation goes. Does anyone yeah, want to start perhaps with um, <laughs> well, defining welfare? Well, I mean, nobody's advocating harm, right? I think, I think the, the risk that there's anybody here or in the audience at home who's advocating harm is pretty small. So the question then becomes, what's your definition of harm, which is the flip side of what's your definition of welfare? And as, as we've seen here, and I think if we'd had other people here as well, there are a range of definitions of welfare. It comes home most strikingly when I think about uh, people who quote unquote rescue dogs from third world environments and in a third world environment the dog is, uh, is full of disease and uh, if it's a female often pregnant which brings with it additional health risks and from let's say a veterinarian's perspective that dog is experiencing very poor welfare and so that dog can be rescued and brought into a first world environment where its disease states will be cured and rectified and it will be sterilized and its health will be far superior and it will be kept in a heated uh, condition in the winter and an air conditioned environment in the summer and, uh, and, and kept in plush carpeting and fed cake and all the rest of it. Uh, and, and, and from one point of view, its welfare is now massively improved, but from another point of view, it's actually dead. From a biological definition of welfare, an animal that is now unable to reproduce is functionally dead. Uh, so you have the veterinarian's definition of welfare and the biologist's definition of welfare in violent opposition with each other, and a psychologist might come in with a definition of welfare that revolves around feelings of psychological well-being, and it will be arguable and will probably depend on the individual animal as to whether that animal is now more stressed or less stressed. Many animals that have lived their whole lives outdoors, free to roam, will be highly stressed to be trapped in a condominium and only ever allowed to move in the outside air when there's a six-foot leash tied around its neck. So a lot hinges on whose definition of welfare you, you think has priority. So I'll jump in and, and also add that I think there's also a difference between harm and risk. So the, the do no harm example, if, if we are going to look at the medical field or the veterinary field, if a dog has a complication and requires surgery, um, it's risky to put that dog under. It's risky to cut the dog open and to do the surgery. The dog's going to recover and potentially be in pain. But if ultimately that dog has the best chance of a, a good life, um, a better life, and is going to live longer because of that surgery, a veterinarian might make that choice. Now, there are things that can go wrong. So there can be mistakes, or someone could suggest a surgery that doesn't actually need to be done, or they could do it incorrectly. Um, and those are problems, but the decision to make a surgery in the appropriate case, even though it might involve risk or even some pain, might be the right choice. And I think that might apply to behavior as well. I think there's, um, 
there's another component to this that I think we need to think about. We all know that with positive reinforcement, there's a vast range of intensity, right? There's something the dog sort of wants a little bit, not very much, but a little bit, sort of positive, and there's something it really, really, really wants. Well, aversive, if you, if you want to think about aversive control, it's the same thing. Um, my example is um, I was giving a seminar once on the west coast of the U.S., and I was talking about teaching dogs to stay with a body block. And what I meant by that is you, you gave it lots and lots of food reinforcement for when it sat and stayed, did you ask, and if it started to get up, then you move your body forward. You just sort of went like this. Um, so you don't touch the dog, you just supplant the space, right? You just go forward, and somebody stood up in the audience and said, isn't that a correction? And I said, I don't know, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> and they stood up and walked out. They left, they left the seminar because they felt I was using aversive control. And my argument is life is full, as you were saying, life is full of, of positives and negatives. It's sort of the basis of animal behavior. And, and I think it's important for us to realize that when people are talking about aversive control, they can be talking about something as simple as simply supplanting space and moving forward half an inch. I'll, uh, I'll give a maybe extreme example. I know some of you here or at home know that I've commented on some of these things on Facebook and elsewhere before. And I've gotten in trouble for just talking about the informational no as I, I describe it or the info informational yes, which is very useful in training because especially for the kind of work that uh, Catherine presented, uh, uh, it uh, reduces confusion if you actually tell the dog uh, not just what it did right, but also what it didn't do right. And it's not punishment in the sense that it's not coercive or punitive, and I think a lot of people out there are confusing these kinds of concepts. So you can actually simply say no, yeah, it's a pruning process. Learning is not just about, acqu about acquiring new information, it's about also eliminating the irrelevant information, and you, you accelerate learning if you do this. That's well demonstrated in cognitive psychology in humans, but also in animals. Now, the extreme example I want to give is, you know, that coyote situation that we discussed on Friday that we have in Cape Breton. Uh, so I was brought in in that research for one reason, is because if we were not going to have a behavioral intervention, what was going to happen is that at both provincial and federal level, they were going to exterminate those coyotes in Cape Breton. So uh, do no harm, okay, let's not kill them. So then what can we do? So we have this model where we knew that uh, the three-phase model, as we called it, that uh, coyotes, you know, habituate to humans in some of those conditions. I'll be very uh, brief here. Uh, then there's the process of sign tracking, actually, that uh, Monique uh, mentioned, where there's some classical conditioning going on. They don't really even realize that they're starting to associate humans with food, but it's kind of happening, the Pavlovian process, basically. And then later on, it becomes operant in some ways where they are really consciously associating uh, humans with food as providers of food and they actively stalk them and everything. So the only way that we could deal with this is come up with what we call a hazing program. Is it pleasant? Do we want to do this? No. But what's the solution? What is the alternative? And the alternative for the government was to get rid of all of them. So, you know, do no harm? Sure, I totally agree. But let's put it in perspective and in context before we judge it, judge it too quickly. James, can I ask you to comment a little bit more in regards to from an anthrozoology perspective in terms of the human factors that come into play here? We've mm -hmm. seen a lot of passion um, in James, our participants. Do you wanna <laughs> 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 um, human factors. Well, I mean, as Clive said, the, 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 the sort of so many definitions of welfare, but I think one of the issues with dogs, particularly, is is the fact that we impose on them our, our very anthropomorphic views of what a good life is, what a quality life is. And um, I think too many people misunderstand that sitting around on a couch watching TV is not a good life for a dog. Um, uh, being a couch potato is not a good life for a dog. Dogs like to be active. They like to be in control. They like to be challenged. They like to be out there foraging, sniffing, investigating things. and. You know, I, I personally think about 80% of the behavioral problems we see in dogs are the result of sheer unadulterated boredom. These animals 
don't get enough stimulation. And um, that's our fault. And it's because, you know, we come home from work, we don't want any more stimulation. We want to kind of veg out somewhere. And uh, our dogs are raring to go and saying, hey, I've been sitting here all day. Let's go, some, let's go and do something. And he's like, eh, yeah, well, I'll take you around the block on a leash. That's not really doing it for the dog. That's my view. I just want to add, to that. <laughs> along with um, the aversive training that Monique brought up earlier and that we've been talking about, you could also add into this things like um, no-kill shelters, for example. So one, one opinion is do no harm. It means to let these dogs sit in a kennel for the rest of their lives, um, which actually could be doing a whole lot of harm. So in some cases, when we think about not harming an animal, we just don't do anything. Alternatively, animals sitting in kennels, we're, we're trying to enrich their environment, which is great. Um, we look to reduce aberrant behavior. If you reduce that behavior to a certain degree, you get to an animal that's not doing anything. That's basically dead, right? So again, you're trying to improve its behavior, trying to do something better for it, and we're actually making things worse. So I think it's really important to just keep uh, thinking critically about these things and instead of saying, oh, we don't want to hurt the animals, we're not going to do anything about it. Instead, we've got to really think about these problems and keep investigating them um, and using science like we've been talking about. <laughs> uh, my, my wife is a pediatric health psychologist. Uh, sorry for bringing you into this, Elizabeth. Um, but she works with kids in hospitals all the time. And one thing that she will tell you is that, uh, and there's a word here that doesn't come to mind, maybe some people that know French can help me with this. Is we, in French we call this acharnement, being too persistent with something. Mm -hmm. So being uh, acharné, being too persistent with positive reinforcement only, especially if it doesn't work right away and it lingers for hours and hours and hours, is actually more stressful and potentially more harmful than doing something like uh, a quick uh, timeout intervention. It will take two minutes and the kid gets, you know, if, if, if I, okay, I don't like this, uh, I have to stop kicking the nurse and spitting at the doctor's face and it will be done uh, quickly. I'm sorry, but I think ethically, there's a reason for going for what works quickly and it resolved quickly, other than lingering this on the R plus forever, and that creates more stress, there's no doubt about it. So that's the other perspective too, on this obsession with R plus and R plus and R plus only, is it doesn't always work efficiently. And in terms of welfare, not necessarily better either. And by the way, if we use science to make those arguments, a lot of people will say, but you know, the scientific literature says that punishment or whatever is bad. Sure, we all agree on this. It's not the best way to go, and we all want to avoid using it. But there are some situations where you have to reconsider, right? And the other thing is, by the way, you can find, as they've pointed out, a lot of literature suggesting that punishment, unfortunately, actually does work you know, from the behaviorist perspective, that it, in the sense that it reduces the frequency or duration or intensity of a behavior, all right? But also you will find a very healthy literature pointing out that R plus only is also detrimental at some levels. So again, let's take perspective on this, calm down a little bit and forget about the, all the bad, horrible connotation that are attached to a punishment as something necessarily coercive and punitive and the same kind of comment could be made for dominance and blah, 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 blah. <laughs> so we'll jump to Prescott. It, this really reminds me when Sam was talking yesterday about jingle jangle. And often we use, we have these toxic words. We have, you know, uh, punishment, ooh, you know, aversi aversive, you know, these things, you know, we get, you know, we have emotional response to them. I have them myself. I, I mean, I'm... I'm no different. I, uh, um, you know, I don't advocate for these types of things for sure, you know. But I, I do find myself questioning myself. You know, why do I always have such a knee-jerk reaction to these things? And one of the things that I try to remind myself of is that we're throwing around a lot of, you know, jargon, and it's like, what are we actually talking about? It's like, oh, you know, you know, uh, you know, kicking a dog in the face is bad, you know, obviously. But then we associate that with punishment. Then suddenly, the, any use of the word punishment becomes associated with kicking a dog in the face, or you know, doing something you know brutally harmful for a dog, or 
you know, semi-brutally harmful for a dog, you know, but, you know, we're, we get lost in the spectrum of trying to figure out, you know, where is it that, what is it that we're actually talking about? And we just make these blind, you know, blanket decisions about, about jargon, you know, when the purpose of the jargon is, you know, not only is it highly contextual, right, you know, because if you talk about uh, uh, one principle in one school of ideology, it's not going to line up with this similar principle in another. For, take, for example, let's, let's drop dog training for a moment. Let's just, uh, talk about equilibrium. If you talk to a chemist about equilibrium, it just means balance. That's all it means. But if you talk to a, a biologist or a physicist about equilibrium, you know, they're going to start talking about chaos, and they're going to talk about entropy. You know, there, you know, we have massive jingle jangle problems going on with these words, and we need to, you know, contextualize what is going on. And we need to remember that, you know, science is falsifiable. Good science is falsifiable. And, you know, just as good science is falsifiable, you know, so, you know, are capable of being fallible, is another way of saying that, you know, so are people. And, you know, we, we sometimes don't say the right word that we really meant to try and convey an idea and we hold people against their words because the context of the sentence or the statement was lost. You know, and then we go out and we sometimes try to crucify them for taking risks and trying to explain a difficult and sensitive subject. So, you know, we can't really move forward, you know, if we, uh, uh, if we have these issues. I mean, I won't forget last night, uh, you know, after several beers, uh, you know, I was with James and Catherine, and we were having just a, a, a riot of a, of a debate going uh, about the evolution of dogs. And, you know, you know, I was kind of jumping back and forth. You know, I was like, okay, I'm going to pick on Catherine with James a little bit. And then I was like, okay, I'm going to pick on James with Catherine a little bit, you know, because, you know, triads are a little awkward, right? <laughs> so <laughs> try to, you know, be, uh, not leave anybody too much out, you know. But the... Uh, um, you know, it did come down to, you know, there were fundamental differences that Catherine and James couldn't agree on, on the issue. And, you know, so I asked them, I was like, okay, so what, you know, ultimately, what evidence would you need to be able to concede your point? You know, and I asked that of both of them. And, you know, they, they had to think about it. You know, that's a tough question to ask yourself. What would I need to, you know, to actually change my idea about something that I'm really, really passionate about? And, you know, the... I, it drives me crazy. I start. I didn't get to do my full introduction to this conference due to technical issues, you know. But you know, I did get the chance to start off with the idea in the, that you know, science is not about facts. It really isn't. You know, we. That doesn't mean though that science doesn't help us understand the world around us, and you know that we can't rely on science. And that you know, I mean, science is a way of thinking. It's a philosophy of the mind. It's not about facts. You want facts? Go into a history book. You know, if you want to think critically and you want to be able to be progressive and you want to, you know, try and actually change things and maybe think of new ways to solve a problem, you know, that's where science comes in. You know, and. You know, there are, there are wonderful books on the philosophy of science, and, you know, if you want to learn more about, you know, ways to try and think about these things differently, because we blind ourselves. I've been wrong so many times about so many things. I, you know, I lost track, you know? And, and some of these things, I, I would go into, you know, rooms just, you know, barrels blasting, you know? And, uh, you know, you get, you realize that, you know, there are maybe ways you haven't thought about certain things enough times that, you know, maybe, you know, maybe we should take a second and step back, or at least for myself, I said, maybe I should take a step back and just, you know, see what it is that, you know, that James has to say, that Ray has to say, that Simone has to say, that Clive has to say, that Trisha has to say, that, you know, Catherine and Monique have to say, because they have amazing insights. You know, that's why I invite them here. And, you know, do I agree with everything they all say? No, I invite people intentionally because I have disagreements and then I get to take them out to dinner and I get to say, you know, I really don't agree with you about this. Um, you know, so, you know, there's a, uh, I just wanna, I created Sparks because I want conversation to continue. I want discussion to continue. And so, you know, we uh, be mindful of knee-jack reaction, knee, <laughs> how's that one, right? knee-jerk reactions to, uh, to simple terminology. Put something in a context, put something in a frame of mind, you know? It, it's, uh, 
Um, we, this bludgeoning of terminology, I can't stand all the quadrant stuff, you know, but that doesn't mean I'm going to go into a case and, you know, not try and, you know, look at the dog and say, okay, how, you know, I want to be as gentle and, you know, uh, um, uh, you know, do no harm, you know, so I certainly have how I perceive that, you know, um, if, if, uh, um, you know, gentler methods doesn't require, you know, a fundamentalist type perspective of theoretical jargon. You know, often these things are just conventions and, you know, conventions change with time. Um, you know, we're, you know, we're stigmatizing ourselves if we don't just, you know, back off a little bit on the jargon and, and you know, talk, you know, more about the applied and less about the theoretical. Thank you, Prescott. Sorry Ray, for that rant. Would you like, Ray? Would you like to comment on this? Um, that microphone. Actually, the answer to that is no, because I, I really don't know much about um, <laughs> your dog. I don't know much about pet dogs and whether you should. It it sounds to me sometimes like you get down to the argument of you know should you spank your child? I can remember when we went through that, you know, and grew up in a different generation. Things have changed a lot in the last 50 years as far as the uh, American public's idea of what humane treatment or what treatment of dogs are or who dogs are. So for many of us that, who grew up where the dog was an animal, and, uh, and it was a very special animal, uh, but um, as, a, as we went along, for example, when I was a sled dog racer and stuff, we, we had rules about how you could treat a dog, you know, how you could feed a dog. Uh, I watch the pictures come up here of, you know, good scientists, and the dogs are overweight. They're fat. And you're going to judge, uh, you know, and one of the major problems out there in the country right now is obesity of dogs. And do you think the dog food companies want to talk about that? You know, um, you look on the back of any package, and I, I've been a consultant for dog food companies, so I said, look what you got on the back of the package. This is what you're advising. And the dog food company said, oh, nobody reads the package. And that may be true, but the fact is, is that there's an acceptance. You're out here think, saying, I shouldn't do aversive conditioning on the dog, but the dog is twice the weight he can be. Now, I don't think it's fair. I, I also don't, I, I don't think you guys, uh, meaning you all out there in the big world, are very fair to dogs. You have dogs for yourself and for your own pleasure. And it doesn't matter whether the dog is castrated or spayed or whether uh, all its rights are taken away and it's not allowed off the leash. And then it just infuriates me uh, when I show up and, you know, after I gave up the Livestock Guarding Dog Project, I went and I started to, to work on village dogs. And I worked for the UN um, on dog bite problems, uh, uh, all kinds of things, and disease. So you want to go out there and you want to take some dog out of some third world country and bring it back here and give it a good life uh, because it's got disease, uh, because it's, uh, you know, got a skin rash, or because it's underweight, or because it's starving to death. You know, well, have a good time. You've got 850 million of them to deal with. And, the, um, and, and why don't you just expand it? Why don't you just go and let's, let's uh, start saving wolves? Let's start saving the dog's ancestor, you know, go out there. When rabies breaks out in Canada, you know, we should go out there and we should inoculate them all, right? I mean, where does the conversation stop? Where does it even start? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that was an excellent non-comment. <laughs> Another question would be, uh, you do have people bringing dogs into their lives and having these kind of grand expectations of what they will mean for them, for the companion dogs, and they don't know maybe any better than to stop a barking dog with a shock collar. That's kind of like a first resort. So how do you kind of bridge that gap between what we're learning and what we're trying to explore in a gray area um, and teaching a, a general public who's not always very knowledgeable about all these different things that we're talking about here today. Well, I'm gonna let someone else answer that because I think I've talked enough about it, but I will say that if we don't talk about it at all, no one's gonna learn anything. So I think it's good that we're at least talking about it. 
Well, I'm sorry, I've, I'll just, uh, I know I've talked enough already, but uh, personal experience, um, working with a, a very fearful golden doodle. Uh, dog was recently adopted, um, had issues with men, and it was a very wealthy owner, and they lived on a very lovely property down by, you know, uh, the lake, and uh, they were very sensitive to barking, and so they threw a bark collar on it. Uh, you know, the electrified kind. And I said, you know, please just take that off your dog. We'll work other ways. And they didn't listen. And, you know, the, uh, I'll never forget, we'd made so much progress. About a week had gone by. And uh, um, I was working with this dog every day. That's how, you know, the owner really, really wanted uh, the dog to succeed. But little did I know they weren't changing this and so I show up and I and, and it was like you know looking at a dog that was like excited to see something it was scared of for the first time in a long time you know people who are experienced trainers you know that look it's like you know almost enough to like you know get you a little teary eyed sometimes and you know you know this dog lights up and starts charging and starts vocalizing you know an excitement and this dog had just been swimming in the lake and maybe that you know uh, added to it and didn't add to it, but you know it started to get the shock from the collar, and instead of running and jumping on me, which I would have you know gladly you know given the dog a hug, it dove and sunk its teeth into my the upper part of my thigh, and so you know there are there are not simple answers to these, but you know that's a common story, and so you know the. Uh, um, you know, I, will, I do want to put out there that, you know, on various theoretical levels, you know, these, you know, tools are tools, sure, and it's like we got to talk about people, right? You can walk, but you don't have to kick a dog, you know? It's not the foot that's bad, it's the behavior, you know? But some things do carry intrinsic dangers to them, and it's difficult for science to look at them because sometimes, you know, we have to... I look at some shock collar research, and I'm like, you know, God, there are problems with this research, you know? I really don't know if I can you know, agree with these conclusions, even though I agree with the spirit of them, you know. But then if you were to ask me, do I want to do more research on it? My answer is going to be no, you know. And so, you know, sometimes ethics, you know, we can't always look to just science to answer ethical questions, you know. The, uh, um, you know, we have to, you know, consider. I mean, Simone was talking about uh, neural imaging. It's just like, you know, I just, he just you know, he said, I just don't want to do that. Um, you know, it's very interesting, maybe other people, but I, I just can't do that. So, you know, um, you know, maybe keep that in mind, you know, when people say, well, how can scientists say blah, 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 you know, these, these things are complicated. I just mentioned we've, something. Yeah, I was going to say one of the themes that we've had um, a lot of is, I guess, there's so much extremes, okay? So whether that's extremes in the philosophy, whether it's extremes in, you know, things like how did our relationship with dogs begin, whether it's extremes in the training methodologies that we want to use. Are there any strategies or things that you would like to contribute or ask people to consider to help bring us all, I guess, in the spirit of what Monique was saying, into a place in the grey where we can have conversations that will help us progress? Yes, Simo. When, when there's tension between, between humans or between humans and dogs or dogs and dogs, there's two things I think that typically work. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Two things that typically work quite well. Uh, uh, and I usually that's how, how I start to try to resolve conflicts or problems with, uh, uh, with dogs. Uh, play, uh, producing endorphins and stuff. It's always good for the brain. Makes you feel good. And the other one is, uh, is a little hug. Hugging, you know, for oxytocin. It hugs feel good. Hug it up, hug it up. I think we need some of that today, don't we? <laughs> could, could, I agree. Hugs are great. <laughs> um, I just um, would like to say, kind of along with also what Prescott was saying earlier, um, there's a lot of information out there. You get these two extremes. A lot of times, you out there, everybody trying to decide how to apply this information, you get confused. There's, it's not obvious that one is better than the other. Um, and I would encourage you to practice critical thinking. You can think like a scientist. You can look at this information and decide for yourself by um, looking at the support that is there, looking at what is missing, looking at what we do know and what we don't know, what's parsimonious, what's not, what are, who are the people that are saying this, how much research has been done on it. Um, and, and you can, in that way, sort of whittle away 
to understand what we do know and where the research is and how much of it you can rely on, um, rather than just randomly looking at all sorts of possibilities and saying, well, that one looks nice, let's, let's go with that and stick with that. Um, because then there really is no rhyme or reason to which one you should listen to, and it would be really easy to be prejudiced about the one you picked because someone you liked mentioned it. But if you realize that these, these answers all have something behind them, right? They're all, some of them have been tested. Some of them have theory behind them. Some of them have nothing behind them. Some of them have experience behind them. Um, and they all probably need to be tested more, but you can figure out for yourself which one is the most supported right now. And then keep up with it. Don't just go, ah, oh, well, that's the answer. Realize that this is always evolving, as Monique mentioned. Trisha? Yeah, I think, I think there's a very important question about how do we influence public opinion? How do we influence dog lovers? How do we change behavior? And I think this is a perfect example of integration of fields. There is extensive information, none of which I know any of, about how to influence public opinion. I mean, there are people who do this for a living, and one of the things I would like to see this field progress into is is, ma is matching up with these people, is getting expertise from them. How do you affect public opinion? How do you affect social change? There's a lot of research on that. I don't know any of it, as I said, but I know there's a lot of research on it. And you know, it's one thing for us to, I mean, it's wonderful for us, for us to talk and exchange and sometimes express frustration about the way things are, but that's not enough. And I think the more we can learn specifically, you know, what what works. There are a lot of things that you can do. You can spend huge amounts of energy doing things that don't work. So I think one of our one of the things our field needs to know what works and how can we do it. Just another thought. Maybe maybe we should stop trying to make this all about science also sometimes. And I think in a sense, maybe it's an ethical question. And I, I, I think you know uh, what you should do or not do with with, with dogs is is an ethical question because if science can can really uh, uh, backfire on you sometimes. Like I said earlier, you know you can find papers showing that R plus is not good, that that uh, punishment can actually be uh, very useful and efficient in some cases. You don't like it, make the ethical argument. Mark Beckoff is making a career out of this now, so go ahead, go use that, use the ethical argument. And I think sometimes it's more solid. Uh, than anything else, uh, because you know it, it's that's about it's about what you think and uh, your your opinion, and it can be documented by science in some cases, and that obviously helps if you can make a solid argument behind it. But it's a lot about ethics as well. Um, I change the subject and a little bit, maybe uh, ask the question in a different way. Um, I'd like to ask uh, uh, Patricia, um, <laughs> do you think we should be able to eat dog? Oh, should we be able to eat dog? Gosh, thanks, Ray. I'll get you. <laughs> I'll get you for that. All I can tell you is I wouldn't. Actually, I've had ridiculous conversations. You really want to end the day on that topic? No, no, I, Ray no, no, Coppinger. What I, what I wanted to do, what I wanted to do. Talk about classical I, I, conditioning. I, I, I listened to you, and you talked about we're going to go out there and we're going to educate people. We should educate people about the proper way. Yet, yet we, in some ways, um, you're imposing on those people uh, what you think is the right way. And as Monique said over and over and over again, we don't always know the right way. So um, I, the, I asked the question for a very real reason, is that when you go around the world, there are lots of places that I go in the world and they eat dog. And so should we go and educate them so that they shouldn't eat dogs? And it seems to me that a lot of the humane societies and so on are pushing in that direction. There's a, there's a movement right now. We're all supposed to write our congressman. Uh, ASPCA is uh, advocating that we don't, um, we can't eat horse, horses in this country. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so they're going to impose that will on, um, uh, on a population because they'll get the, uh, the government to change the inspection uh, and so they won't be able to inspect horses, so you won't be able to sell horse meat. And uh, I personally think uh, whether I think it's okay to eat horse 
or dog or something doesn't matter. You're imposing rules on large populations of people who see it as a tradition. When I go to Italy, there's horse markets, and you can go buy horse sausage in Hamburg and so on. And uh, you say that here in the United States, and all of a sudden, uh, the, the people are revulsed by the idea. Is that a word? Revulsed? Uh, I, um, I, do, I don't know. But let, me do, let me just say one thing. Do you remember when I talked, the first talk I gave, I talked about there's always a conflict, there's always a tension between being an individual, doing what you want, and, and sort of living in society. And part of society does have rules. Um, and all I can tell you is one, I don't think anybody in this country should eat dog. Two, um, I think it's fine for there to be some social boundaries. Um, so I'm not a complete libertarian on the other hand. So in, in other words, I think there needs to be a balance. Is it okay to beat women? No, I don't really think it is and I think there should be laws against it. So there are, there's always this tension between sort of individual, what an individual wants to do and what social boundaries are and it changes and it evolves and it's very cultural. And now I think we should change the subject. I think it's great. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's, um, I think that's not working. I think it's great that we can um, not impose our ideas but share them openly um, around this table. Um, I don't know if James wants to contribute anything about changing attitudes and perceptions towards animals over time, that, uh, you know, that they do. Well, I, I think it's just important to realise, sorry, it's important to realise that, you know, all of these, the roles that animals play in society varies from culture to culture. So uh, we know that dogs play different roles in different cultures. In our culture, they are family members and we don't typically eat our family members or do unpleasant things to our family members. It's not part of our culture to do that. But if dogs are perceived as livestock, then they're in a different category. We do appalling things to livestock in this country because they're livestock. Um, we don't consider them family members. So, you know, things are very fluid around the world and very much culturally determined. Um, but at the same time, uh, I think m most people in the world have a sense of what cruelty to it is, what unnecessary cruelty is, and um, I think uh, uh, most people in the world can agree that probably it's not a great idea to allow people to inflict unnecessary cruelty on sentient beings. And uh, uh, you may, you will, you'll have some cultures where they'll say, well, actually, that's part of our culture. We like inflicting cruelty on fighting bulls or whatever it is. Um, but you'll, you'll find plenty of people in those cultures themselves that say, well, actually, I think it's appalling what we do to bulls um, or it's appalling what we do to dogs. So, you know, cultures are changing as well uh, and attitudes are changing and I think it's generally progressive to avoid being cruel to animals uh, if we possibly can. Um, uh, but nevertheless, cruelty persists and it persists in our own, our own culture. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I don't know if I answered the question. I think, I think you did. Right, I think yeah. what everybody just experienced was Sparks 2014. So please give everybody a round of applause, yourselves included. <laughs> if you are at home, I hope you're giving yourself a round of applause as well. Um, give your dog a, a, like a nod of we did this. So what you just saw was Sparks 2014. I want to give a huge thanks to our audience here in Newport, Rhode Island. Thank you so much for being with us. Wonderful, wonderful, hey, wonderful. Julie, Julie. Um, I also want to give. Julie. Yes, I'm sorry. You have to hang on for one second. Um, I have to interrupt you because uh, if it weren't for the work that you and Mia put into this conference, uh, the online experience and the in-house experience would have been completely different. And so I think there's something brewing in the wings. I would like them to come out now so everybody can see it. Do we get a puppy? <laughs> <laughs> For dinner. Thank you so much. Very smelly, in a good way, in a good way. <laughs> smelly in a good way, thank you. Um, so we also wanted to thank, right, we got the audience, wonderful, your participation has been instrumental. Also, Varvid, our tech people have been amazing. Thank you so much for helping us. You guys. And last but not least. You know, <laughs> there's one guy who is the reason why we are all here, right? 
And Prescott, when you first contacted me last year about this, I thought, this sounds interesting. I better do a little due diligence on this guy. What are his qualifications to be inviting hundreds of people last year? It was Seattle to Seattle, and, and this expectation that there would be an audience of thousands out there in online land. I thought, oh, you know, what's, what's a who? I don't recognize the name, but maybe I ought to. So I, you know, a little bit of due diligence. We're talking here to a retired opera singer, a guy with a Bachelor of Music. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Far from it. On the contrary, it's a wonderful thing. But it's like not self-evidently apparent that he's the guy who can do this. And he says he's going to bring in Ray Coppinger. Last year, Ray, Ray was here with us. And Monique and Alexandra Horowitz and Mark Beckoff and Michael Fox. And I'm forgetting people and it's embarrassing. Catherine, you were there. Um, Patricia, you weren't. Uh, I mean, an absolutely star-studded cast last year. And I'm thinking, maybe I shouldn't have agreed to this. This seems really rather like, um, uh, like hubris, you know? How is, that, how is this kid going to pull this off? And my goodness, he did, right? And now we're back this year, and it's still Prescott. I mean, there, we do now have a board, but when it comes to the actual work, you think this is such a slick operation, it's so well run, you know, there's so much going on, there's all these members now, thousands of members. You think there must be a Sparks back office, right? But there isn't, there's no Sparks back office. There's just Prescott and his laptop. That's how the whole thing is done. So, hmm? there, there, is, there is a small Prescott back office, and that's Brittany, who's absolutely <laughs> magic. My goodness. So I don't know if I can get around here. <laughs> I'm Prescott, Brittany. you are just absolutely awesome, man. I don't know how you do it. And here's a little, a little black dog for you. One of us gets, <laughs> one of us gets a dog for dinner. <laughs> Which one of us is rapping? You're rapping. So I think that's it for our live broadcast. Thank you all for being with us for Sparks 2014, and we'll see you in 2015. That's right.